As a responsible person with growing concerns for your privacy and personal liberty, you want to know where we're headed and what you can do about it. We ask the experts what you need to do to take prudent and responsible action to safeguard your family's wealth and well-being and what basic first steps will help you to be aware and prepared. ReluctantPreppers.com Welcome back, Reluctant Preppers. We have a significant returning guest today. David Morgan, founder of TheMorganReport.com and Silver Investor, is here with us again on Reluctant Preppers to tell us what's going on in the silver and precious metals markets and what's coming up for the dollar with the uh, versus the Chinese yuan being added to the SDR basket of currencies at the end of this month. David, thank you for joining us again here on Reluctant Preppers. Well, thanks for having me, Dunnigan. It's good to be back. We're only two weeks away from the September 30th date, uh, which some people have predicted, analysts including notables such as Jim Rickards, should be a watershed moment for a uh, power shift in fiat currencies globally when the Chinese yuan will be added for the first time to the SDR basket of currencies. And uh, associated with that, Jim Rickards is predicting a major dollar collapse and an upset in currencies on that day actually or uh, starting on that day could you first explain uh, to those uh, of us who who need more what the SDR basket of currencies is why it's important and what the significance is of the yuan being added to that well the SDR is a uh, currency that's a basket of currencies with the US dollar and the British pound being the primary components to it it stands for special drawing rights. Gold is a component of it, although it's difficult to determine whether or not the uh, gold component is actually in existence or has been rehypothecated or hypothecated a few times. Regardless, it's a very small market. It's only control. The only trading that's done at the current time is through the IMF itself. However, Jim Rickards has been leading the uh, the the cause, so to speak, on the SDR potentially becoming the fallout position of a reset in the global currency system. And of course, for that to take place, you would need all major currencies to be represented, represented and the yuan would be one that would need to be in the basket. So that is going to take place at the end of September, and its weighting will be I think it's somewhere in the 8 to 10 percent range. I forget exactly. But the dollar, the U.S. dollar is still predominantly uh, the leader as far as the weighting it goes. And it's primarily based not on the productive capacity of the nation state. It's more or less tied to what the trading volumes are in a particular currency. And the two currencies that are traded globally probably the most are one, the U.S. dollar, obviously, and secondly, the pound or the euro. So the yuan will be in there. And I'm actually going to be writing about this SDR situation in depth in the next issue of the Morgan Report. But let's suffice it to say that the ones that seem to be pushing this the most are the Chinese. Now, whether or not that information that I have obtained is accurate or not, I can't get like a third source to verify it. But what I can say is that most nation states that are even halfway honest know that there needs to be a reset and that the U.S. dollar cannot continue much longer with the debt basis that it has on a, you know, globally, nor any other currencies, really. So this would really be another fiat scheme but it doesn't have a nation state to fund it. It has all the nations of the world to fund it. So there's no nation state to collapse if the SDR fails. Jim Rickards, I think, is um, straight up about it, really. I read his book. Actually, I've read them all. But the one on um, <clears throat> uh, the new case for gold, he talks about the SDR being enacted as he doesn't use the word global currency. That's my words but that it could be achieved and these people, or I should say these nation states that have an excess of U.S. dollars could turn them in for SDRs. So it's a way or a basket of currency so that basically you do have a global currency and if you feel that the dollar is like overvalued, you could you know swap that in or trade that into an SDR. 
But what he said is that it basically have to be, it could be achieved if the populace was unaware of what it really means. And those are my words, not his. But the essence of what he was saying is that it's basically another fiat scheme, but it could work if the unsophisticated didn't really realize that it was just another paper chase. Again, my words, I forget. But he, was, he said it about three times in the book. In fact, I think I highlighted it which I thought was honest. Uh, certainly the bankers certainly want to keep their system alive and well and continuing. And again, I'm going to go into this more in depth in the next issue of the Morgan Report. I'm not trying to hold back. I've just, in fact, gathered all the research. I finished reading uh, one of the major articles last night, in fact, and I got up this morning and wrote in my to-do list that I'd start working on that for the report. And Honestly, haven't even typed word one yet, but uh, I'm still thinking it through a bit. But it could be a major shift. Will it work or not remains to be determined. Will it be implemented or not remains to be determined. But there is a fact, and that is that the yuan will be part of it. And the potential for it to become the next uh, major uh, fiat system certainly is out there in the, uh, let's say, the intellectual realm of the elites. So were you making the point that the SDR as a basket of currencies is a, uh, can be appeared to be more valuable because it's more uh, diversified holdings? People can perceive that it provides some protection or a hedge. So there may be an, an outflow of dollars that are being held by major holders from all over the world wanting to exchange U.S. dollars for this more desirable, balanced, or uh, hedged uh, currency and and you're saying that as long or or Rickards may be saying as long as the uh, people don't realize it's just trading one fiat for a bunch of fiat it doesn't uh, necessarily increase your uh, risk posture but if it's perceived that it does that could spell a uh, drop in perceived value for the U.S. dollar is that how that or did I understand correctly? Yeah, you got it just about perfect. I wouldn't say it's more valuable uh, and you kind of I would say contradict yourself. I'm not trying to nitpick. Uh, but, yeah, it, it basically, since it's the basket, so if the dollar goes down and the yuan goes up in value, the overall SDR basically stays a lot more stable. So it's kind of a stability factor, if you will, for uh, a currency. So it's a currency comprised of many other currencies and people or, again, they should keep saying people, but nation states or large holders of a currency they don't really like could shift from that currency in the SDR. But the SDR overall would have more stability because, as I said, in the currency markets, as things ebb and flow, also the idea could be that it would be a nation-to-nation -nation currency only and not one that the citizenry would hold. So you would have, let's say, U.S. citizens using the U.S. dollar, but that would be about it eventually. It wouldn't be overnight. And you would have, uh, you know, the yuan in China and euro in Europe and that type of thing. But nation states would keep settlement in SDR. So that's a possibility as well. So a lot to it, really. Uh, again, you know, my take on it is to be determined. Uh, do I like the idea of going from one, you know, paper chase to another one? No. Do I want to see this one fail? Uh, I guess philosophically I probably do, but not from a practical perspective, certainly not, because I'm not uh, willing to go through what will obviously take place on pretty much a global basis, because there'll be a huge shift in mostly downward in the standard of living of almost everybody, and there'll be huge disruptions throughout the labor force, just in time inventory, goods and services, uh, there'll be a lot. There'll be, you know, you know, and it will be different in different areas. But certainly, it could be as upsetting as the Great Depression. And you know, I don't think anyone wants that to happen. What I would like to see happen is a reset that's equitable. But unless we change the way money works, we're not really going to change anything. So, if the SDR doesn't change the function of interest rates, the elite banking system controlling everything through the issuance of unbacked, unsound paper systems, we really haven't achieved much. We might have achieved, uh, you know, extending the uh, problem. We might achieve the ability for to, to fool people. 
Again, going back to what Rickard said, it's my words, not the way he articulated it. And we might um, dodge a bullet for a few more you know, months or years. But inevitably, I don't think there's any way out other than a grand reset, which means a true repricing of assets that are real, not fictions, which is largely probably 40% of the financial system at this point. The derivatives and the currencies and these bets and swaps and uh, counterparty risks and bets on uh, interest rates and everything else that involves the financial market to this point are at, a, at such a level that the leverage or gearing is so huge that the ability for the system to stand strong during uh, a minor tipping point, I think, is uh, wishful thinking at best and probably laughable, uh, unfortunately. And so a true reset without some type of pain to go along with it, I think, is impossible. That doesn't mean that the SDR can't come to the fore and we could go on that model for a while. But uh, again, that we'll have to wait and see. And specifically, we've been talking about currency impacts of a, the SDR and the yuan joining the SDR, but what about the impacts that that may likely have on the precious metals market? Well, that's a great question. It sort of depends. It could. The impact it would have on, let's say, gold, because gold could be part of, the, part of it. And in fact, in this uh, research paper I just finished reading uh, last night, it was kind of emphasized that gold, an argument within this research paper was that gold should be included for stability purposes, and my words, not this research paper, but uh, psychological reasons. I mean, even people that aren't gold bugs are familiar with gold. I mean, there's people out there on the street, if you ask them if the U.S. dollar is gold back, we'll look in the eye and say yes. They don't know any better. They think it is. But regardless, so I think gold would be included. Now, if it were, it'd behoove the bankers or the people that are running the SDR, which, of course, is the IMF, to reprice gold at a level, I'll use Rickard's number, 10,000 an ounce, because that would give a great deal more liquidity to a real asset that would be a component of the SDR, and it would provide a couple things. One, it would uh, help lower the debt levels of uh, nation states that had large gold holdings, and secondly, it would provide a psychological component to the nation states themselves and the people they're in that would say, well, maybe it's not a perfect currency, but it has gold and it has all these other currencies. It's going to be real stable. And relative to what we have now, it certainly would be, at least for a while. The catch, of course, is do the bankers uh, do what uh, they've never done before, which means not uh, turn the gold into paper gold and um, – say that they have more than they actually have. I mean, this is goes back to the original warehouse receipt for the goldsmiths, and they realized early on that, you know, only about 10% of the gold ever actually took uh, a physical transaction, that people were happy to take the gold certificates that they had issued and exchange them instead of the physical gold. And when they caught on to that idea, they just issued themselves gold certificates and no gold backing to those, and they inflated the quote-unquote money supply, and that game has gone on from that day till this. And, you know, to think that the SDR with, a let's say, a substantial gold component, uh, once the yuan is, you know, brought into the fold, will, uh, you know, stabilize things or not. Again, I have to use my, you know, what I'm using often in this conversation, uh, a to be determined factor, but history is very, very clear that usually it uh, only works for a while. The uh, phenomenon you're describing, where the uh, gold guilds uh, were or handing out certificates that they couldn't redeem to expand their wealth and expand the apparent uh, availability of money that really wasn't available, reminds me of my engineering background, where they talk about when you're designing plumbing fixtures and water pipe uh, capacities for a large 
uh, building, for example, they say you use the diversity factor. You don't need to assume that everybody's going to flush the toilet at the same time. You don't have to make the pipes that big. You can assume, based on the statistical size of the set, uh, some smaller and smaller and smaller percentage that's actually going to be needed at any one time. But you spoke in a recent interview on this topic about the psychology factor that it kicks in when you reach a certain tipping point. And if you could touch on that so people are firmly aware of when that, um, basically that gamble stops paying off for the people who are who are basically misleading. And in this case, that, that includes uh, the, basically the, the fractional reserve lending banking system that we have. What happens when people figure out when you reach that critical whatever it is some people say one percent or ten percent of awareness in the population when people are aware that there really isn't anything behind it and they start to take action to grab something of real value well first let me preface it with it's a very rare event i mean these things only take place in recorded history on very very rare occasions but this time it's a global system so it will be a run to gold or run to precious metals unlike any other recorded history And so what takes place is sort of like, and I've used this analogy probably too often, but it applies is a flock of birds with the lead bird taking a hard left. No one really knows why, but they all follow. And they go in a completely different direction. So the analogy is that the, you know, less than a half a percent that own physical gold in today's world, that were to double to one or two or three percent, which is completely feasible, once that phenomena takes place that, oh, my goodness, I have got to get out of paper and I've got to get into gold, silver as well, that once that takes place and the psychology changes almost instantly, there's not really enough gold available at today's price for that demand to be fulfilled. And in fact, probably on a paper level, prices would be substantially higher than they are now. And this would be driven primarily by fear, not greed. It will be a belief that my pension is not going to be there for me. My um, my savings account is getting bailed in. Uh, my insurance policy or my insurance company is worthless. Uh, my housing or real estate portfolio is going down the tubes. I mean, I hate to sound negative, but these are real events that have taken place in history. It's not like I'm making this stuff up. All you have to do is really do a cursory study on what has happened during either hyperinflations or depressions when there's been a revaluation, especially under a fiat system. And you'll see that the distortions are so great at the top, which is where we are now, that the rebalancing that I'm talking about becomes very apparent almost instantly. So again, something that's rare, but I think it's going to take place in my lifetime. I mean, I've been looking at this, done again, as you know, for probably four decades. Um, certainly I've missed a few of the points. I mean, one, uh, I've said in other interviews is I thought it would probably have arrived before now, but I love to question myself as, uh, Ayn Rand used to say, you know, check your premises. And one of my premises that I completely missed was really bringing China, which you've been talking a lot about China on the interview, bringing China into the Keynesian model and letting them know that all they have to do is go on a non-backed fiat system and they can build out their infrastructure in a very quick uh, manner and they can bring prosperity, quote, unquote, prosperity into their country literally overnight. And if you look at what's taken place in China from roughly 2000 to 2015, obviously it's built out substantially and there's a price to pay. Because uh, using another analogy, it's sort of like uh, an Olympic athlete going the steroid route. Uh, Certainly, they might be bigger and stronger and faster and better and win the gold medal, but there's a price to pay for that. And that's an analogy for going on a Keynesian model. It might build up faster. It might look great. It might bring more people, more jobs, and more quote-unquote prosperity, but in the long run, it's cheating. It doesn't work in the long run. It only works on a short-term basis. So because they brought China into that model, they had another, you know, 1.2 billion people to continue a Ponzi scheme. Because the only way a Ponzi scheme works is you have to have more and more people at the bottom of the pyramid to feed the people at the top of the pyramid. Well, China wasn't in the four in the 90s, really. But they were brought in, as I said, and there isn't an exact date, but they were brought in, let's just for talking purposes, say the year 2000. So you bring in 1.2 billion more people to play this game, you're certainly going to take the 
came out another 10 or 15 years, which, what's, which has taken place. But now there's really no one else to uh, continue. And so going back to the flock of birds analogy, there's uh, the leaders are out there flying around looking for, you know, where is a safe harbor? Where is a safe haven? Where are we going to go? And once that determination is made, hey, maybe the safety is over here in this asset class that uh, a lot of people don't pay attention to. And that takes hold of the flock. Once that happens, look out. It's going to take these uh, these asset classes and rebalance things in a very, very significant way. Coming all the way full circle back to the SDR, <clears throat> if the SDR is, let's say, loved by um, all the elitists, all the bankers, the G20, everybody blesses it and is all in bed together, uh, and they can use the um, propaganda machines throughout the uh, global media system for the mainstream, uh, you know, they could press it out further. I don't want to be, uh, you know, one way about this. I want to be open-minded about it. And again, you know, from a personal perspective, I mean, you know, I don't want to see uh, a dire end of this system. I want to see a clean uh, transition. But I think at this point, that's almost impossible. If we could turn the discussion now from sort of future options to uh, current realities, what are you seeing in the last six weeks since we had you on as uh, gold and silver were breaking through resistance levels? Silver was breaking, punching through 1850, then it went through 1950, then it went through 20, and it has been consolidating for about the past, uh, you can tell us better than we, about six weeks or so. But uh, what are you seeing uh, on the internals of the, the market behavior? Where do you think it's going next, and why do you think that? And uh, what will you be watching to confirm uh, what you're looking for? Well, we've certainly entered into the, the third leg and the most important leg of the secular bull market in the precious metals. We know that because the volumes are very significant, that silver is leading gold, and that the mining shares are rising at a factor roughly of three to one. What we also know is that this market actually extended uh, relative to what it normally do, does during any normal year, and the seasonalities really are not working like they usually do. August is usually the low for gold, certainly it might be. But we are going to sell off, and I've done some uh, video updates for the website members. I won't go into great detail with the interview here, but I do expect a consolidation. I do expect somewhat higher prices by the end of the year, barring a, some event that takes them far higher rapidly. And I think the best thing to do is if you don't have metals to buy them at almost any point, certainly if you get silver under 20, you should. For the longer term, and gold uh, you know, around the $1,300 level is probably sufficient. And there is a possibility we could get a sharp correction, especially you know this SDR discussion we keep talking about. I mean, there is a possibility that um, it could take gold either way. Uh, and just based on rhetoric, really by doing really nothing physically, but just by you know, having a speech made that uh, gold will not be part of the SDR, it's been determined, and blah, 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 we don't want gold in there. Or conversely, uh, gold is going to be a significant part of the SDR, blah, 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 blah. So depending, you know, on what is said in the mainstream uh, media could have an effect on gold's price in a short-term basis. And of course, gold and silver are correlated about 85% of the time, so it would probably spill over in the silver market. When describing uh, the factors that are going to drive gold and silver next, you mentioned some factors that you're keying in on, such as silver leading gold or the miners moving at a multiple of the metals price movements. Why are those factors specifically meaningful to you as you watch the market behavior? Well, one is a lot of gray hair. I mean, I've been, you know, it's been pretty much my passion to study money and monetary history. And of course, the futures markets, as well as you know everything else I look at, currencies and the bond market, and you know anything financial. But in a bull market, silver leads, <clears throat> and silver uh, was oversold much more than gold was. And of course, silver was lagging gold even when this bull market rekindled in uh, January. And it was concerned. In fact, I did an interview with Jim Paplava about this, and it was at a kind of a turning point. He said, you know. Where are we? And I basically said, if silver doesn't turn up and overtake gold, 
Um, you know, this could be a false rally. And he asked me, you know, if I thought it would, and uh, I did, and it certainly has. The other part is, first of all, and the most important thing is volume. I mean, it can't, if we had this kind of um, price action and the volumes are very, very low, in other words, of just not much participation in the market, and then when I, you know, I wouldn't be uh, convinced that we're in a bull market, but the volumes have been significantly high enough. In fact, <clears throat> to digress a little bit, the open interest is so high in the futures exchanges out of the United States that we're at a point where we could, not would, but could be where there is a runaway to the upside. Now we're in a situation where most of the surprises will be the upside, not to the downside. Not to say that there won't be some um, sell-offs that are orchestrated, but there's already been two orchestrated sell-offs that have uh, transpired in this new bull market, and both have failed miserably. The longs have stood their ground, and the sell-offs have been very rather insignificant relative to what they usually produce on a, on a sell signal. So we are in a new bull market, and it's stronger than I've seen in quite some time. So I think we need to uh, you know, factor that into our thinking. So silver leads gold. Uh, in a bull market, most of the time, I mean, you know, and, and when I say lead, uh, let's just look at the peak. Uh, silver peaked in uh, April or 1st of May 2011. Uh, so that was, let's call it May. And gold peaked in September. So silver started down, which was leading the direction the metals were going to go for the next four or five years before gold turned down. That was leading, a leading indicator that the bull had run its course for the time being, and then we were either going to consolidate or go into a, a bear market within the secular bull. And that's exactly what took place. So does it lead 100% of the time? No, they have been flow. But um, overall, the whites lead the yellow in a bull market, and the volumes and the um, determining factor about how much the shares outperform the metal is important to know that we're in a bull market. And these are things just from experience I've watched for years. And I want confirmation. You know, I want to see gold and silver both moving. I want to see volumes high and I want to see, you know, the leverage factor that the shares provide manifested in price action. So we see that. I'm convinced. Doesn't mean um, that the bulls function to shake off as many people that are bullish as it possibly can, which means there'll be some severe and sharp corrections that will scare people out of the market, unfortunately. So be careful. Most people have no business using any type of leverage whatsoever. It's for the professionals only, and only on a very cautious basis. Although I have to put my, I have to <clears throat> admit that the whole system uh, for the metals is based on a um, on a totally leveraged system out of the futures markets. I mean, that's what determines the price, not the physical reality. Before we let you go, could you uh, remind people where they can find your work, what they can get uh, for free from you, and then if you at the end would touch on the options that you have available for people, the resources you have available for people on um, silver accumulation at, at very little uh, uh, outlay, and also on emergency food storage for our preparedness community. Certainly be happy to. Best thing to do is go to the website, www.themorganreport.com, all one word, themorganreport.com. Give me a first name and an email address. You'll get the Riches and Resources Report for free. It's got two great movies in there, one about the, dying of the, the end of the age of empire and another one on what took place in Argentina during their currency crisis. Also, there is a silver stacker program in there that does – very easy to achieve. It's an automatic accumulation program that fits most people. And for those people, then, I know there's plenty out there, especially during these tough times that cannot afford precious metals. Food is a no-lose bet. I have a, a web page devoted to that. It's called silverprepper.com, all one word, silverprepper.com. And I endorse it because it's non-GMO. They do have some superfoods. They have a gluten-free bucket, which is what I use personally. And it's priced alongside all these other uh, food storage type of situations. 
They even offer, I think it's a sample pack for hardly anything. I think it's like a $20 bill or something. You can try it out. Uh, I do use it. I do eat it. I look at it as emergency or actually cooking, being single again. Uh, some of that stuff, like the chili, for example, is pretty good. I mean, you know, I guess, you know, to feel like shopping or going to the store or whatever, just pull one out, throw it in some boiling water. It doesn't take long and it's pretty tasty. So, you know, I'm trying to be a little bit humorous, but it's also true. So if you're so inclined, you can check out silverprepper.com. And if you're on that website, uh, and you like it or you don't like it, you can send me some feedback at support at themorganreport.com. And if you see there's a way to improve it or make you happier or you need more information about something, certainly if you have the time, uh, we appreciate your time to send us a little note in an email and uh, we'll try to abide by uh, you know what the market demands. Well, David Morgan, founder of themorganreport.com, thank you once again for joining us here on Reluctant Preppers. We'd sure like to have you back shortly after the September 30th start of the SDR to see what you are uh, able to report about the um, world's reaction to that and what you think it signals for gold and silver's future at that time. Well, excellent, Doug. Thank you for having me on the program. 